Hello friends, what a blessing and a privilege for us is to share this special program with you. This is I Like to Know, the program that most of you enjoy the most, as is the program that allows us to answer your questions, the inquiries that you sent us, and we want to invite you to continue to send them. You can send them to tv at samtv.org and let us know where are you from. We love to know the location, the country or the city in which you live. That way we can actually know how far and wide the message and our programs are reached, are, are sent around the world. So thank you for allowing us to get to know you better. And we thank you for, again, making this program one of the favorites for you and as well as for us, as we can study, we can prepare ourselves to answer the questions according to the Word of God. I have the privilege today to be with Pastor Stephen Bohr. What a blessing to have you, Pastor. Welcome to this program. It's always a wonderful privilege to uh, participate in this program, especially with you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> it is always an honor. And so we are really delighted that we can, uh, together, answer some of these questions that people are sending us, that are asking. And those questions, some of them are really interesting, really uh, unusual sometimes. I actually find myself seeing through questions that are have never thought of. So it's a blessing to really study the Word of God together. So, Pastor, why don't we start this program with the word of prayer, if you don't mind guiding us into prayer as we open God's Word. All right, let's pray. Our Father and our God, what a privilege it is to open your Word and discover what your will is for our life. Amen. We have so many different questions. Many of them we will not be able to answer this side of eternity. Mm. But if we can find the answer, we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you will enlighten us so that we might be able to share an answer that would be satisfactory and a blessing to those who have sent them to us. Amen. We ask that you will bless this program, that your Holy Spirit will be present to instruct us and to empower us Amen. to live by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Amen. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, Pastor, we have this interesting question from someone um, named G. And he's asking a, a question in regards to a struggle he's having in his life. Let me share with you the, this. Let me read the question. It says, I'm an Adventist concerning the Sabbath. In the book of Nehemiah, when he closed the gates for the Sabbath to avoid trade on God's holy day, Nehemiah placed men in front of the gates to act as security guards to stop trade. I'm in a similar position. I'm a presidential guard in my country and I have to perform duties on the Sabbath to protect the president, uh, similar to the Secret Service in the United States. So please assist me as I am confused. Some say it's essential services as doctors and nurses to serve the public and highest office. My question is why did Nehemiah place guards to avoid trade on the Sabbath? Isn't the same as breaking the Sabbath as guards to perform duties on the Sabbath? I try not I try and not claim money on the Sabbath for my duties. Please assist me. I'm deeply confused and troubled. I need and I try to f and I, I need and I try to feed my family uh, and has no other source of income. I don't want to find it a pleasure to do my own will or call the Sabbath a delight. I just want to provide for my family an extended family. Please assist. Thank you for your ministry. So the question is, he has a situation where he's a guard, has to protect the president and including Sabbath duty. And he's wondering, did Nehemiah did wrong or right in having guards? Was it necessary for that? And can he apply that to his own special, uh, personal experience? What can we say to this pastor? This is a very interesting question. Well, there are several issues that he brings up here that we need to um, discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, he says that he needs to provide for his family. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes we have to choose between being faithful to God and having faith in God and providing for the family. Mm -hmm. Providing for the family would be secondary mm. to uh, being faithful to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Uh, you know, I've heard many individuals tell me when I preach about the Sabbath and evangelism, they say, well, how am I going to feed my family? You know, I have to work on Sabbath. Right. And if I don't work on Sabbath, my family is going to suffer need. Well. It's a lack of faith because God is able mm -hmm. to allow you to find a job right. where you can actually keep the Sabbath. So mm -hmm. 
we need to obey God first and leave the other in the hands of God. Right. Uh, the second point is, can somebody else do the job on Sabbath or do we have to do it? Mm. You know, he says that he has to protect the president on Sabbath. However, uh, that's a job that others could do as well. So that's the second point. Uh, the third point is that the cases of uh, the Secret Service and his job are not parallel mm -hmm. because his job is a secular job protecting the president, mm -hmm. whereas the guards in Nehemiah's day, they were protecting the, the gates because they were protecting God's Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, there's no evidence that the guards that Nehemiah put there were paid for their services right. to guard the gates. Uh, so, uh, you know, all of these factors need to be taken into account. The bottom line is that once you start down the slippery slope of saying, well, you know, um, operating a pharmacy on Sabbath is necessary. People have to get medicines. And, uh, you know, um, uh, an individual uh, needs uh, to transport people to church on Sabbath, so you have to drive your taxi. Mm -hmm. And so once you start down that slippery slope, then the Sabbath, the sacredness of the Sabbath, loses its, uh, its sanctity. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, doctors and nurses, that's understandable. And the Spirit of Prophecy makes it clear that the money that is made on Sabbath uh, needs to be returned to, for charitable purposes because many Adventists, you know, they use that uh, escape clause yes. to, be, to work on Sabbath and make money on Sabbath. In that case, you're working for, for remuneration. For gain. And right. so for, for financial gain, and that is breaking the Sabbath. Absolutely. So once we take all of those uh, factors into account, I'm not sure that uh, his scenario of being a guard to the president fits the same as those guards who were protecting the Sabbath from being desecrated by all these merchants that were coming to the gates to sell their wares. Absolutely. It was a way that, that you mentioned, Pastor, the, you know, Nehemiah saw the only way to prevent these foreigners to come and some locals too were conducting transactions on Sabbath. And he said, let's close these. And he called for a, for a reform in the city of Jerusalem to sanctify the Sabbath. They were profaning the Sabbath, you know, they were uh, taken for granted. Uh, and so this is why he made that element. And he actually said, my, I, he put his own servants, he put his own people that I guess trusted or he trusted to, to control that with a purpose to honor God's Sabbath. Um, now, another point that you brought, and then he probably also has a confusion and you mentioned that is about nurses and doctors. One thing is to have to do a, a Sabbath duty um, because no one else can, you know, and, you, and in that situation when you're taking care of patients is necessary, absolutely. But uh, if you are a doctor or a nurse and you say, well, you know, I'm gonna work on Sabbath because it's, it's like allowed for me and I will stop, you know, uh, but I will take Sunday off so I can actually go spend time with my family and have fun with my family but I worked on the Sabbath. That is also a thing that has to be analyzed by the person. You know, some people don't realize that the Sabbath should be, if it's in you, within your power, you, within your, your, you know, your situation, your position, to avoid working, you should work, avoid working at all costs. Um, if you are, you know, if you have somebody to cover you that day, it's better to have somebody else to cover, but not to choose and say, you know, oh, because I am, is allowed for me, I'm gonna just work on Sabbath and I schedule myself on Sabbath so I can have Christmas off or New Year's off. You see what I'm saying? Some so, people, some yeah. people use that excuse. Exactly. You know, I had a police officer in a church that I pastored mm -hmm. in uh, Illinois mm -hmm. uh, towards the beginning of my ministry. Mm -hmm. And um, so he says to me, uh, you know, people need to be protected on Sabbath. I'm a police officer. Yeah. And so once again, I told him, once you start down this slippery slope, yeah. you're going to justify many things that are not proper to do on Sabbath. And, um, you know, he still continued working as a police officer. Um, you know, he, he would come to church when he could, when he had a Sabbath off. But God wants us to be in church on Sabbath. He doesn't want us to be guarding the president on Sabbath. He wants us to be in church worshiping corporately, Absolutely. hearing the message, singing praises to the Lord, 
uh, and render him the honor that he, uh, that he deserves. Absolutely, putting your mind in harmony with God, delighting yourself in the Sabbath, and the environment which, in, which he could be in, or anyone that chooses to work in, instead of honoring God, when they're able to, you know, it's really probably not going to be conducive to, to worship God. You know, you're going to have to listen to, you know, talk, conversations, things that are nothing to do with the Lord. And so it's important yeah, for him to first seek God and put him first. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. you know, just follow your conscience. Listen Amen. to the voice. Pray about it. Listen Amen. to the voice of your conscience and then step out in faith Amen. and do it. Amen. You know, kind of like Israel, they had to get their feet wet when they put, were going to cross the Jordan. Absolutely. And they did, and then the Lord did what they couldn't do. Amen. Amen. Thank you. This is very good. I hope that Brother G can find uh, the right decision in his life. Let's continue. The next question, Pastor, comes from Theodore, and he is uh, writing us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And his question is this. How did Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar know what the Son of God looked like when He looked into the furnace? Thank you. God bless. Well, Ellen White has the answer to that in the Bible as well. Right. Um, in Daniel chapter 3, mm -hmm. uh, Nebuchadnezzar has already had contact with, uh, with the Hebrew young man, with Daniel, right. before. Because mm -hmm. in chapter 1, he was very impressed that they looked better, they were healthier uh, after the test. And in chapter 2, Daniel had already, uh, you know, interpreted his dream mm -hmm. uh, and told him what the dream was. So they, they were acquainted. And there's no doubt that Daniel and his three friends spoke about God. Absolutely. And uh, what, God, what God actually looked like. Because we're talking about Christ here, mm -hmm. not talking about God the Father. Right. Ellen White makes this clear in the book Christ Triumphant, mm -hmm. page 178. She wrote, the Hebrew captives had told Nebuchadnezzar of Christ, the Redeemer that was to come. And from the description thus given, the king recognized the form of the fourth in the fiery furnace as the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So they had already talked to him about Christ, the Redeemer that was going to come, and they had actually described to him what he looked like. And uh, it's interesting to notice uh, going to Daniel chapter 3, mm -hmm. um, there's a very interesting uh, parallel that we find there. And um, I'll uh, look up Daniel chapter 3. And uh, by the way, Nebuchadnezzar knew that the Son of God was Michael, mm. the archangel. Mm. Uh, how do we know that? Well, Daniel 3.25, mm -hmm. when Daniel sees the fourth person in the furnace, yes. uh, he says, look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the fourth, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. God. Mm -hmm. So he says the fourth looks like the Son of God. But who was that person? Notice verse 28. Verse, Nebuchadnezzar spoke and saying, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And the right. word angel in the New King James Version is capitalized. Mm -hmm. The first letter is capitalized, mm -hmm. which means that this is not a common angel. Right. This is Michael, the archangel, archangel. who is mentioned then in chapter 12. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the answer to the question is that the, the Hebrews had spoken to Nebuchadnezzar and described to him what Michael, the archangel, looked like. And uh, therefore Amen. he says, He's like the Son of God, but he knew that the Son of God was Michael. Amen, amen. That is a very, very clear. You know, like you mentioned, Pastor, Pastor, the Spirit of Prophecy does make that clear that it was through the teachings, the example, the testimony of those, you know, Hebrew boys that Nebuchadnezzar understood or knew about who God, who Jesus was to them, you know. And then, obviously, as you mentioned here, he recognized the Son of God, and then he recognized that it was Michael, the archangel. Praise and it Lord can't be, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is, it says the Son of God, mm -hmm. yeah. which there's two persons. That's it would exactly be the Father right. and the Son. Yes. Even in the Old Testament. Exactly. He's and, uh, and of course, the, the Jews, they have struggles explaining how uh, there's an individual who's the Son of God. Maybe this is the reason why 
uh, the religious leaders didn't like Jesus when he said that he was God's son <laughs> exactly. because they knew that he was talking about that person in Daniel that yeah. delivered Daniel from the lion's den and also the three young men from the furnace. And, and, and that's another thing. Jews don't really like the book of Daniel because it really points out so many things about Jesus and his role in, uh, as in prophecy as well. Yep. But, but yes, uh, so I, we want to invite Theodore to read also uh, Prophets and Kings, page 509. Paragraph two, it's also um, another place where a spirit prophecy basically re reaffirms what you just mentioned, that it was because he knew who Jesus was through the example, the testimony of the young Hebrew boys. All right, let's continue right. with, this, with our question we have today. And we, um, this is the question. Uh, I have a question. Ivan sends us a question that says, I have a question concerning attending weddings on Sabbath. Is it okay for an SDA person to go to a wedding party, dinner, where waitresses and other paid workers will be laboring to serve the guests on Sabbath hours? I'm asking because I have heard arguments that Jesus attend those kind of ceremonies and that it is not breaking the fourth commandment if an Adventist person goes to a wedding on Sabbath. I would like to know what is your opinion. Thanks, mm -hmm. Ivan. This is an interesting question, Pastor. And um, before I get you to answer, you know, let me share that I was uh, invited by uh, at one point by somebody to do uh, to a wedding on a Sabbath. And Sabbath afternoon it was. And because I was a little surprised, actually almost shocked, to be honest, Pastor, that uh, the person that requested the, you know, who invited us uh, was an Adventist, was an Adventist, and it was going to be taking place, the ceremony, the wedding ceremony, at an Adventist church on Saturday afternoon. It was not after sunset, it was before sunset. And I was really surprised. I said, this is interesting. How is it possible that um, an Adventist wedding on Sabbath, you know, hours? Now, he was marrying a non-Adventist. And, uh, Which is a red flag in itself. Exactly. And then she was a Catholic. Anyway, just to make this story even weirder, I, you know, it was f somebody that was kind of family to us related. So uh, I, you know, I decided, okay, well, is the ceremony, the, the, the celebration, the thing is later, you know, it, it is maybe it's going to be done in a way that I haven't seen before. So I decided to go. This is a, a few years ago. Was you, were you officiating? No, 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 no. I was just invited to attend, okay. you know. No, I would have, I know what I would have said. <laughs> but I was, you know, early on in ministry, you're a little confused. So things like this are come to your way and you're not sure, you know. So I said, okay, maybe six. I, I wanted to find, find out, you know. I said, okay, maybe the ceremony aspect can be done the Sabbath, you know, in a special way, I guess. I, I was kind of analyzing this. And so as I go, you know, I attend the ceremony. It really shocked me because um, who was performing the ceremony in an Adventist church was not a pastor, as the pastor, but a Catholic priest. In the Adventist church. In the church. It was performing this wedding. So I, I was very disappointed, obviously, you know, and the ceremony, I wouldn't say was necessarily, um, you know, uh, uh, sacrilegious or something like that. It was very, very, very solemn in some ways, but I, I really got confused and I felt this is not how we were supposed to do. This is, this is contrary to God's word. This is, again, my impression of that time. So, uh, you know, I feel that we are to be very careful to, you know, not perform things that can be done in another day on the Sabbath day. We, I think we have seen this uh, and sort of mentioned this before, you know, if things can be avoided on the Sabbath, we should definitely to them another day. And, and in this case, I was, I was just surprised that a church would allow that to happen, that they allowed this, you know, marriage to happen in, in, in the Sabbath hours. I really was very surprised and very disappointed with that experience. God married Adam and Eve on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's really no biblical example of a wedding that took place on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Now, there's several things that we need to take a look at mm -hmm. uh, to make a decision. Yeah. Um, I don't think that a marriage ceremony on the Sabbath in an Adventist church between two Adventists where there is no reception 
It's a simple ceremony, yeah. declaring them man and wife. I don't necessarily see that that is a bad thing right. or problematic. The big problem with weddings is the preparation. Yes. You know, the, the dressing and the hair and the, you know, preparing, employing lots of individuals to do the catering. And the cameras I mean, and the pictures. And then, and all and then when the people get together in the reception, they're talking about secular things because they're not going to talk about Bible things in a reception. Yeah. And so it's everything that goes in with the preparation mm -hmm. of the wedding that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, but a simple wedding where the couple stand in front of the pastor, the pastor, they do the vows and he pronounces them man and wife and that's it, that's the ceremony. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like a baptismal ceremony, it's kind of like... Uh, uh, renew, uh, 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 renew of vows as well. Simply, yeah, or know? a vow renewal. Yeah. Uh, the, the problem is with all of the trimmings right. that go along with the wedding. Yes. And you know, the Bible, the Bible doesn't say one way or the other, but the Bible speaks in principles. Yes. And uh, in Isaiah chapter 58, we have the principle. Mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah 58 and verse 13. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, mm -hmm. from doing your pleasure on my holy day, God says, mm -hmm. and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor Him, not doing your own ways, mm -hmm. nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you should delight yourself in the Lord, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the Bible gives us the principles, and people need to listen to their conscience. They need to be sincere and say, yeah. is this wedding ceremony and everything that goes along with it, is it in harmony with God's will? Does it focus me on God? Does it, does it uh, help me reverence the hours of the Sabbath? And if your answer is no, then plan your wedding some other day. Absolutely. It's better to have the wedding some other day because that way you can have your reception. You know, people, the ladies can do their hair yeah. and they can do their dressing and, uh, you know, the catering can come and you can pay the caterers and everything. It's better to do it on another day. I don't know why uh, people would want to have, uh, you know, Adventists would want to have a wedding on the Sabbath. And also, as you mentioned, you know, there you have people that you have to pay caterers, picture, yeah. you know, for media photographers, all those people that are not, you know, they're there to do, perform a job. So why would you violate the Sabbath? And I think that connecting to the story or the question we had at the beginning, you know, from Nehemiah, Nehemiah put those guards to guard the people from, you know, breaking the Sabbath to, uh, you know, dishonor the Sabbath by selling, by buying, by doing trade. So therefore, if we are to be examples today to the world that we honor God and we keep the Sabbath holy, we are to let the Sabbath be the day of the Lord and be only for holy purposes, you know, mm -hmm. for things that will uplift us to the Lord. And, and yeah, like you mentioned, like I said, you know, maybe that my idea was, okay, it's a small ceremony, but it was not like that. So it really <laughs> was a shock. And um, now the question I think I have, maybe Ivan also has this question. What about if you're invited to a wedding by a non-believer, non-Adventist, would that be okay to do it on Saturday hours? There's plenty of weddings that are going on, on Saturday, you know, by, by people, you know, secular people. Should we participate of them if they expect us to be because we're family members, for example? Yeah, you know, I, w I would not, you know, some people do this to please the family. Yeah. The question is, what's most important, pleasing God or pleasing the family? Yeah. Uh, you know, you, if you take a stand, you say, and you explain nicely, you know, the Sabbath is the day that we're supposed to focus on spiritual things on the Lord. And I feel like if I come to the wedding with the reception and everything, it's going to distract from the central purpose of the Sabbath and explain it. At least if, if you're really nice in the way that you explain it, yeah. uh, if they don't understand, they'll be less angry with you, <laughs> I <Yes>. think. <laughs> uh, but they don't understand that it's not family that comes first. Mm -hmm. What they don't understand is that God comes first. And your example will be a good witness to them. Absolutely. Uh, whereas if you go to the wedding and the temptation is always to talk about worldly secular things, things yeah. you know, worldly things. And, uh, you know, many times the food is not the kind of food that you would regularly eat. So there's all kinds of issues when you come to that. Now, uh, I noticed here 
Mm -hmm. uh, in this question, something very interesting, the argument that is used is that Jesus uh, attended a wedding on the, on the Sabbath. Well, the fact is, there's no reference to the wedding in Cana taking place on the Sabbath. You can't use, uh, you, if Jesus married Adam and Eve on Friday, <laughs> there's no evidence that uh, really Jesus attended a, a wedding ceremony on the Sabbath in Cana. There's no evidence of that. Some people have argued, I've heard this argument, because weddings could take seven days, sometimes in the old days, that it was, you know, he was celebrating seven days, you know, <laughs> but... But when did the seven days begin? <laughs> exactly, and, <laughs> and you know, I believe that is a different, uh, we have not really understood perhaps the type of culture and how it was. I'm sure that Christ did not, you know, uh, profane the Sabbath by, by doing his own will or, or, or enjoining in conversations that were not conducive to the, to the, to the will of God. Uh, if they were several days, if those weddings did take place and they passed through the Sabbath, I do believe that it was a, uh, uh, you know, they will actually honor God correctly and keep the Sabbath holy. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, whatever we do on the Sabbath hmm. has to keep our focus on the sanctity of the Sabbath. Yeah. That's the, that's the principle. Mm -hmm. You know, does what we do on a certain, uh, on a certain Sabbath detract us from what the Sabbath is all about, which is to focus on our Creator, how wonderful He is, yeah. and not distract us uh, to human uh, everyday affairs. Absolutely. And, and, you know, not assume either, because, the, again, there's no evidence biblically that Jesus spent more than, you know, than a day on a feast, uh, even though, like I said, some people have said that they do take forever or take seven days. That's assumptions. There's Bible that never since say anywhere where Christ was on a feast on or, a, or, a, or a marriage on the Sabbath day. Yeah, you know, sometimes there's these traditions that enter the Adventist church, like, for example, Ellen White said that uh, the trip to heaven is going to take seven Indeed. days because everybody has to keep one Sabbath before they enter the kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that's just a conjecture. Uh, there's no, uh, first of all, Ellen White doesn't say that they have to keep a Sabbath before they get there. She does say that the trip to heaven is going to take seven days. Mm. It would be an assumption yeah. that we're going to arrive there on a Sabbath. Yes. So we need to be careful about assumptions. Amen. Well, we look forward to the next time we can meet with you. Thank you for your participation. Send us your questions. Let us know uh, how we can, God willing, answer the questions correctly by the grace of God. May God bless you. See you next time.